Stripping wall forms is fun. There's no other way to describe it. It's always fun when you got a nice sunny day, when your back doesn't hurt, and when you can just put your head down and work. The other thing that's fun is you finally get to unwrap these things and see what it is that you've made. All of the effort that went up to this day is now going to be examined. Whether the vibration was right and whether the reveal strips were right, and I am delighted to report that we got it right. The next step in this process is to build the drainage structure. The first component is the pipe. It's a four inch diameter perforated sewer pipe, heavy wall. The joints are all glued. It's laid directly on the footing. The perforations are put on the bottom part of the pipe so the water doesn't get too deep before it's captured in the pipe. And once it's in place, it's time to put in the second part of the structure. The second part of the structure is the crushed basalt. It's clean two inch. By clean, we mean there are no fines. The only thing we're putting in here is what fell through a two inch screen. We're doing that so that nothing plugs up the spaces between the rocks. No matter how it's compacted, there are always going to be little cracks and crevices for the water to migrate through as it finds its way down to the footing and into the perf pipe. That is important. Look at this truck. One of the slickest tools you'll ever see. It is being controlled remotely by Kelly Sconce so that he can operate this truck both forward and reverse. He can steer it. He can make it move slower or faster. He can speed up the rate that the conveyor is carrying the rock out of the bed of the truck. He can speed up the rate that the conveyor is spinning that actually projects or throws the rock onto the site. And he can move that conveyor left and right and up and down to place it pretty much exactly where he wants it. That thing will hurl a rock up to 80 feet from the back of the truck. Now, when he's got it spun up like that, you don't want to be standing anywhere near the impact zone because those things will hurt you. But in applications like this, it's turning much slower. He's controlling where the rock is hitting with remarkable accuracy, and he's putting exactly the amount of rock in here that I need. We're burying the pipe. It will be protected under a layer of this rock, and then we'll come on up with the backfill. A tool like this is expensive by the hour and cheap by the job. What that means is, when you realize what this truck costs every hour, and you can find that out on our Patreon page, you think, well, why would I do that? I'm going to bring a backhoe over here or an excavator, and I'm going to dump the rock out of the trucks and pick it up and reach over the wall and sprinkle it. And then you have a fit of sanity and realize, wait a minute, this truck is both delivering the rock and placing the rock. There's no possible way that I could get this work done with any sort of a wheel tractor or a track machine and men with shovels for, I will say, even three times the amount that this really slick outfit owned by Clint Hatfield will get it done for. He shows up on time, he never breaks anything, and when he drives off, the job's done. How do you beat it? The third part of this drainage system is the delta drain. Now, delta drain, in this case, is overkill. It's a continuous sheet. It's a plastic sheet with truncated domes pressed into it and then some filter fabric glued on one side so that it, when it's attached to a wall, creates a permanent chase or a, a place, a space for the water to drop straight down without even coming in contact with the concrete wall. Ordinarily, it's used in basement walls where the inside needs to stay dry. The reason I'm using it here is because I don't want this wall to be saturated with water all winter. I want the groundwater and the water in this soil that's pressed up against that wall to not be in contact with the concrete because saturated concrete or masonry will over time effloresce. That is, the salts and the alkalis continue to generate inside the wall and leach out to the surface as the water kind of migrates through the concrete and it results in really ugly white blotches which appear and grow over time and have to be acid washed off. You've probably seen it on masonry structures in wet climates. I don't want that. So I went ahead and took the extra step of putting delta drain on the uphill side, hoping to mitigate that. You see that beautiful blue dump truck? That's another one of Umpqua Sand and Gravel's rigs. They do not just have really nice front dumping trucks. They've got good 10-yard dumps. They have transfer boxes. They have belly dumps. They've got anything you need. 
and at the risk of repeating myself, I am bound by gratitude to point out that they have donated this rock to this project. Boy, do I appreciate it. The last part of this drainage system that I want to talk about is the filter fabric. This is not road fabric. This is filter fabric. It's sort of a felt-like configuration rather than the woven stuff that goes under a roadbed. Its purpose is to filter the clay particles that are going to be part of the backfill out. So they will stop above the filter fabric and only the water will travel through to get down into the crushed basalt that is down there around that pipe. Otherwise, over time, the clay would gradually contaminate and plug up the basalt until it would just be a slab of clay with rock in it, and it would be really hard for the water to find its way into the pipe. As we come up with this material, the rock and the filter fabric and then the native soil and then the rock and the filter fabric and the native soil, you probably notice that we're maintaining a layer of the rock against the face of the wall, that we're wrapping it in filter fabric and we're maintaining that layer of rock all the way from the bottom to the top of this wall. We're doing that to eliminate the possibility of something that's called wall jacking. If you just backfill a retaining wall with expansive soils, and this is an expansive soil, that wall will be pushed over no matter how strong it is by this expansion and contraction component of the soil. Here's how it works. In the winter time, the soil saturates and it swells up tight and it pushes against the wall. That's not a huge deal. But then what happens in the summer is that soil shrinks and it pulls back from the face of that wall and leaves a gap. You've probably noticed a crack against the face of a wall where the soil comes in contact with maybe the foundation around your house or a retaining wall. Summertime, the soil shrinks and there's a crack. And what happens is little bits of rock and dirt erode and break off and fall down there and leaves and twigs and bits of material fall into that void over the summer and into the fall. And then in the winter, when the rains come again, the soil saturates and swells up and pushes itself back out just as far as it can go against that wall, except this time, there's more material there. And so, very similar to water freezing and expanding, more and more material wedges itself against the face of that wall, and so the pressures in the wintertime mount until finally that wall will begin to yield. It'll push over a little in the winter and then stand there in the summer while the dirt pulls back. That's called wall jacking. We don't want it to happen. So we're making sure we've got an 18 inch to two foot wide layer of filtered crushed basalt all the way from the bottom to the top of this wall. My geotechnical engineer, Carl Broda, has informed me that I will, he will not be comfortable with, nor will he stand behind, placing any structure any closer than 10 feet horizontally to this wall. So I've got an automatic 10-foot setback before the house can start, which means that about half of that, 5 or 6 feet, which is the width of this backfill, is never going to have any vertical loading except the rockery that I place on the top, which is free to settle as far as I'm concerned. So I'm not compacting this too tight. Keep in mind that as you're compacting against a retaining wall, the vertical load that you're putting with that compactor, which is fierce, measured in thousands and thousands of pounds, is also translating to a lateral or horizontal load against the face of that wall. So as you hammer down on the backfill, you're also hammering sideways on the wall. The last thing that I want to do is stress, pre-stress this wall with my compaction before it ever has to hold up the dirt. So I'm only compacting this backfill behind this wall to maybe 60 or 70 percent as per Mr. Broder's instructions. The plastic that I put on this wall months ago to keep the cut dry so it wouldn't get wet and slump if the rains came early turned out to be a bit of an advantage. I asked Carl Broda, Carl, do I need to cut that plastic out of there before I backfill that hole? He said, no, don't do it. It will do no harm at all. It will not reduce any of the bearing or angle of repose capacities of what you're putting in there. And it may tend to reduce the moisture in that backfill a little bit due to groundwater percolating through the rest of your pad. So with no harm as a possibility and a slight possibility of a benefit, it was easier just to leave it in. So we did. This drainage system was designed with the wall. Not only did Scott Harvey weigh in, but Carl Broda did, 
and the city had very stringent requirements that the water be um, transported from behind both these walls out to the storm drain system under the street. The reason it had to go into the storm drain and not just through weep holes, which could have been cast into the bottom of this tall wall, letting the water drain out onto the neighbor's property, is because once I have disturbed the course of the water that falls from the sky or runs onto my property from an adjoining property, if I do anything to influence where that water goes, I take responsibility for it. So if it ran from behind my wall onto my neighbor's property, that's a damage and a harm to him that I or somebody is going to be liable for one of these days. The city made it clear from the beginning, my engineers made it clear from the beginning, that that was not a condition that they could stand behind or even permit. And so I have to do whatever I have to do to get this into the storm drain system.